Hi, my name is Rebecca Claussen, and currently I am a pre-K through fifth grade Spanish teacher at the Henry Barnard School. It's a laboratory school on the campus of Rhode Island College in Providence, Rhode Island. But before I did any of that, I have taught French, Spanish, and English as a second language to preschoolers through college students. And before any of that, I was a really shy kid that didn't come out of my shell very often, that didn't feel very comfortable talking. But then I got exposed to two things that kind of changed my life. First was acting, and I really fell in love with drama. I loved being on stage, and that really helped me to come out of my shell and not be such a shy kid. The second thing I discovered was learning another language. I studied French from the time I was in kindergarten all the way through high school and then majored in it in college. And combining those two things, learning how to act and learning how to speak another language, really helped me to not become a shy person. And now I have spoken in front of hundreds of people, I've performed on stage in front of thousands of people, I don't have that fear of communicating anymore. And so I want to talk today about how we can use drama techniques to help build communicative skills in your students. So let's think first about why we should use drama in the world language classroom. First of all, many teaching methods are for cognitive learning. It's the cerebral intellectual part of language learning. We think about should we be using implicit grammar or explicit grammar? How do we combine the four major skills of reading, writing, speaking, and listening? Um, should we use comprehensible input? All of these decision makings we, we think about as we're preparing lessons for our students. But drama addresses the affective side of learning. This is the emotional side. And this is an important skill that sometimes gets overlooked in language classes. This is the nervousness side of language learning. It's the excitement part of learning about another person's culture. It's the empathy of being able to put yourself in a different person's perspective. Um, so this is a really important skill is being able to teach students how to tap into their emotional side so that they can use that to inform their language learning studies. Next, Drama is learning by doing. You have to use all parts of your body. You have to use all parts of who you are to be able to be good at acting. It helps students to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. And that's really important for language learning as well as cultural appreciation. It's being able to see things through the lens of somebody else's eyes and understand this is why we say things the way we do in a different language. This is why they do things a little bit differently than what you might be used to from your own language or your own cultural context. It is putting yourself fully into another language's context. And that's really important to helping a student learn the language. Third, Communication can occur in a variety of ways. It's not just about using proper grammatical structures. Body language and facial expressions and gestures, these are all important parts of language learning, but they're also important in drama. When we're learning dra drama techniques, we're teaching students how to use your face well, how to use your hands well, how to use your whole body to tell a story. And that becomes really important in another language. Oftentimes, students don't have the vocabulary that they need to communicate. And so we need to teach them that there are a variety of ways to get your message across. And so using your whole body as a communication tool is a really important skill as well. Next, acting as someone else can help lower a student's affective filter. So your affective filter, that's the emotional side of your brain that sometimes gets in the way of language learning. Because we get so nervous, we get so caught up in, oh, I want to be able to say this sentence perfectly, and I don't want anybody to laugh at me. So that affective filter goes up, the cognitive side goes down, and language learning is impeded. But acting as somebody else can help lower that for a student, and that can help increase language retention. 
It increases a student's self-esteem, their self-confidence, their spontaneity. These are all things that helped me as a student, as this shy kid, these are the things that helped me come out of that shell because I kind of felt like I could step away from that shy persona that I felt I was kind of stuck in and now I could become somebody a little bit different. And so helping students to remove themselves from their own personality and feeling like it's okay to be somebody else, it's okay to try out um, the, the personality of someone else, be in that person's world for a little while, that really helps with language retention. Next, drama can bring together all those skills. It can bring together grammar and writing and reading and speaking and listening, pronunciation and culture. It combines them all. You can think of students writing scripts and reading scripts. You can think about the grammar that has to go into script writing. Um, and then the speaking part of it and the pronunciation. Memorizing a script is a really great way to work on a student's pronunciation because they have to say things over and over and over. That repetition is something that really, really helps them with pronunciation skills. So when we're acting too, we're focusing a little bit more on just expressing ourselves in a meaningful and fluid way rather than focusing on this has to be a perfect form. Sometimes maybe when we're writing with students, we focus a little more on the form. We want the verb structures to be correct. But when we're speaking, even as fluent native speakers, we make mistakes when we speak and that's okay. And so when we're acting, it kind of releases that tension from students of, I have to get this right. I have to get this perfect and allows them to just Get your meaning across in whatever way makes sense. And the, the goal is not perfection. The goal is communicating meaning. Finally, drama is fun. It's fun to act. It's fun to get dressed up. It's fun to use costumes. And when language learning is enjoyable, the student's motivation is going to increase and their retention of the language skills is definitely going to increase. So these are the reasons that we want to think about when we're going, huh, why do I want to put drama into my classroom? These are things that are really, really going to help a student to learn. So we've talked about the why we want to use drama techniques in our language learning, but now we want to talk about how to create a safe drama environment. So just because we're using drama techniques in the classroom doesn't mean we want to have our classroom full of that negative kind of drama. Um, we want to make sure that our environment is a really safe place for students to express themselves. We talked already about wanting to lower a student's affective filter. And so it's important that we create this environment in our classroom that invites students to participate, that invites students to be expressive without fear of ridicule, without fear of um, being, being made to feel silly, all those kinds of things. Those are what we're trying to reduce. And so it's really important at the very beginning of using any of these techniques to establish some ground rules with your students so that everybody knows this is a safe place. So one way that we can do that is ease your students into drama activities. We don't want to jump straight into, okay, now we're going to perform um, a Shakespearean play in front of an audience of thousands of people. We want to ease them in slowly, give them a little taste of drama, and then build up from there. So a great place to start is with more low-key activities like pantomime. You can do things like even just playing a game of charades gets a student aware of their body and how they can use gestures and facial expressions to communicate meaning. You can play a simple game of charades to practice vocabulary words, something like that. And from there, you kind of build up on their skills before they're called upon to act out a scene in front of their peers or in front of a larger audience. Next, we want to make sure that we teach our students to applaud and compliment their classmates. That's really important because they're the students are really putting themselves out there. They are not only using the intellectual side of their personality, but now they're using the affective side, that emotional side. And that's a really vulnerable thing for a student to do. So we want to make sure that we're teaching our students to 
recognize that every single time a student performs in this way, whether it's um, acting out a pantomime or acting out a scene or doing an improv game with each other, at the end, we want to tell our students to applaud the participants, maybe compliment them, reward your students for being supportive and encouraging of one another so that they all feel like, okay, we're in a safe place where it's okay to express myself and others are going to recognize that and appreciate it rather than ridicule it. Next, when students make mistakes, which they will, either ignore them completely if they're not really that important, or if it's something that's a recurring mistake maybe that you want to point out, thank the student for the opportunity to point that out. Thank the student for helping the rest of the class to maybe learn a new grammatical structure. Or um, maybe you say something like, oh, you know what, I realize that I didn't teach this very well, so thank you for pointing that out to me. Rather than um, making the student feel bad that they made a mistake, celebrate the fact that they made a mistake. Like, oh, you know what? It's really important that we learn from our mistakes and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to point this out to everyone else. Um, that also helps um, relieve some of that tension that students might feel to get everything perfect and get everything correct. They might feel a little bit more free to express when they realize, oh, hey, if I make a mistake, I'm going to get celebrated for it anyway, um, rather than kind of attacked and jumped on and, oh, but you shouldn't have done it that way. Remember that our focus is going to shift from perfection to communicating meaning. So as long as meaning is getting out there, then they're doing a perfect job and the mistakes are just learning opportunities for everyone. Finally, we want to make sure that we're using lots of costumes and accessories and props and all of those fun things. That's what makes it fun. But it also gives the student an opportunity to step outside of themselves. Um, when I very first started teaching 20 years ago, I taught high school Spanish and um, I would have students do dialogues in front of the class. And I found that they were really shy to do that. If I just called on them and they came up to the front of the room or whatever, and they're performing something in front of their peers, that was a really hard thing because they're performing as themselves. And so I adopted the trunk of wonders. I, I got this big plastic tub and I painted on the side of the tub, trunk of wonders. And I went to places like Goodwill and Party City and I filled this trunk with just random things, just crazy, crazy clothes and silly hats and silly sunglasses and big bulky necklaces, all kinds of craziness. And before the students would perform a dialogue, I'd give them one minute to go into the trunk of wonder, dress themselves however they wanted, and then come to the front of the room. And it changed everything because now the students felt released from, I'm performing this as myself. Now I'm performing in a silly hat with a silly shirt and these crazy pants. And so it doesn't matter if I make a mistake, I already look silly. So kind of takes that pressure off of, oh, but I'm the cool kid. I have to look cool in front of my friends. It's, you know what? None of us look cool. We all look silly. We're, we're kind of leveled. Um, everybody starts on the same uh, footing that, you know what, we're all equal here. We're all equally silly. And so if you make a mistake, it's okay because you're not really making a mistake as yourself. You're making the mistake as this character that you're playing. That really helped my students to express themselves well. Now, we live in an age of COVID where we're not able as easily to share these things. But what do actors do? We improv. And so that's kind of what we have to do right now. So if you're thinking about using some of these techniques right now, maybe if you have students that are virtual, just tell them to, to go in their own closet, find something goofy that they can wear and bring it back to that Zoom call and they can put a crazy hat on. Maybe it's, you know, changing their, their virtual background, something like that, so they feel a little more comfortable. Um, if you have students that are live in the classroom but you can't share things, maybe if you know that on Friday we're going to be doing dialogues in front of the class, give the students a head up, heads up and they can bring their own things from home and that way they're not sharing until we're free from COVID worries and then you can have your trunk of wonders back. But there are ways around things, we just have to be a little bit more creative with how we get students to express themselves. But even with COVID, we can get students expressive, um, acting out emotions, all those kinds of things. And now um, with masks on, 
we have this extra layer of we have to get students to act with their eyes more. Do you find yourself when you're wearing a mask, you smile really, really exaggeratedly with your eyes because you realize that people can't see your mouth anymore? Um, these are actually all really helpful skills for us is teaching students, hey, we're taking something away here. Um, but now you can use your eyes, you can use your hands, you can use the rest of your body to express yourself, but you can't use your mouth anymore. Um, th that's something that's part of language learning. It's, it's taking away different things, you know. Here we, we are in a, a situation where we have to speak another language, but I don't have that vocabulary piece that I need. How can I work around it? Okay, and that's kind of where we're at in COVID times. We're trying to figure out how can we work around the problem. Um, and that's an important skill in and of itself. So. Make sure that we're creating a classroom where students feel safe, where they feel like they're not going to get attacked for expressing themselves. That will really help them to um, come out of their shell and communicate to each other a lot better. All right, so now I've got you all excited. We know why we wanna use drama in our classroom. We are confident that we can create a safe space for students to feel comfortable using drama in the classroom. So now we wanna start talking about kind of the nuts and bolts piece of it. So first we wanna think about different things to consider when we're choosing drama activities in our classroom. First thing we wanna think about is, do we want this to be something short or something long? Um, there are benefits to both. There could be a 30 second little improv game that you play that teaches students how to think spontaneously, that teach students how to react in different situations. That's a super beneficial tool in your classroom. Or you might think about doing a long performance. Maybe students are creating a video that takes months to prepare and put together and it's going to be this long 45 minute film or maybe they're doing a 20 minute performance live in front of an audience that takes several weeks to get students um, rehearsed and you know all the props gathered and the costumes made and things like that that can also have benefit um, so you need to think about which one am i am i thinking about doing something short and spontaneous or something that is a little bit longer that takes more preparation and more rehearsal. Next, you want to think about, do I want my drama activity to be nonverbal or verbal? And again, both have benefits. The nonverbal games that you can play teach students to use their body language to express meaning, um, teaches things like gestures. And gestures are an important part of language. They are different. When I lived in Mexico, a little girl went like this to me. I thought she was saying bye bye and I walked away. She was saying come here because that's what we do in Mexico to say, come here, it's been a key. Um, so those things are important. Those things communicate something. And, and when I misinterpreted the gesture, the, the communication was lost there. So playing games that just focus exclusively on nonverbal cues like that can be really beneficial in the language learning process. Or are we focusing on the verbal piece? Are we focusing on being able to express meaning through words and vocabulary and grammar and all those kinds of things? Next, we want to think about, do you want your activity to be open or closed? And what we mean by that is, open is something that is improv, that hasn't been rehearsed. It's just throwing students into a situation and having them act. Um, so that might be through an improv game. It might be just through giving them a situation like, okay, you're in a doctor's office. Let's see, let's see you act out the types of things that a doctor would say to a patient or a customer would say to a cashier at a store, things like that. That would be an example of open activities where it's not written down, it's not thought about ahead of time, it's just spontaneous and kind of natural conversation, but it's gonna have a lot more mistakes in it and a lot more pause and a lot more, it's not gonna seem as polished, okay? It's something that is closed means Either the students are going to work on writing a script and perfecting a script and then rehearsing that script and coming up with a polished, finished product, or um, students are going to use an already prepared script, but that they don't have a whole lot of input into. It's just 
memorizing the script. And again, both have their merits. Okay, if you're if you're looking at an open situation, it's great for just teaching natural conversation for students and having students be able to react to different situations that they might find themselves in. But the merits of a closed situ situation are, you know already that your language is perfect and then you rehearse that and it's memorizing rehearsed perfect language that gets stuck in students heads and now they have perfect language stuck in their head so both are really beneficial you just need to decide which one am i am i needing for my situation right now and then last is process oriented versus product oriented and again they both have merit um, do you want to focus just exclusively on the process of acting and all the steps you need to think about that's important. You need the students to be thinking about how they're expressing themselves through their facial expressions, through their gestures, through their body language, all of those things. But it's also important to think about my end product. Is this something that's going to be performed? Do I need it to be polished at the end? Or is this something that we're just using as a um, an instructional tool within the classroom and so it doesn't really matter if it's polished we're just working on the the process of getting there okay so all things to think through and decide before you decide on the activity that you want to do you want to think about okay how is this best going to benefit the curriculum that i happen to be working on right now how can i best fit this in with what i'm already doing in class If I were there with you, we would definitely be playing some of these games that I'm about to teach you. Unfortunately, again, we have to improv a little bit, but I'll do the best that I can to explain these games and then maybe see if you can try them out with your students. So here are different drama activities that will get your students talking. So one idea is a game called Yes And. So you can say that in your target language, however you want to say that. Um, this is a great one for practicing vocabulary that you've just learned. So maybe in your class, you've just done a unit on travel, for example. Um, so the way that yes and works is it's a way for students to collectively brainstorm. So one student might say, I need to bring a suitcase when I travel. The next student says, yes, and you also need to bring your plane tickets. And the next student says, yes, and you also need to bring a bathing suit. And the next student says, yes, and you also need an umbrella in case it rains, something like that. The reason that we call it yes, and is, again, remember, we want to create that safe um, environment with students that um, they don't feel like they're being judged. So we don't want to call the game no, but <laughs> because that gives it kind of this negative vibe. Um, we want the students to be building off one, of one another. Um, so again, just a great way to practice vocabulary, get the students talking about the vocabulary words that they know. So that's one game you can play. Another fun one is called the hitchhiker. So the way that you would play this game is you can set up your chairs in your classroom um, to look like a car. So maybe two chairs in the front and two in the back to simulate a car. And you pick three students to begin the game. And one student is the driver and they can kind of pantomime that they're driving. One is sitting in the passenger seat and then there's one person sitting in the back seat and you have one open seat that's going to be taken by the hitchhiker coming up soon. So you give the three students in the car um, a situation to talk about, whatever you happen to be discussing in class. So maybe you've just done a unit on the weather. And so the students need to start improving a conversation about the weather. What's the weather like today? Oh, it's sunny. I like it when it's sunny. It's not raining. Something like that. Whatever they, they are um, capable of doing at the language level that they're at. But then you introduce a hitchhiker. So you pick another student that's going to enter the car as the hitchhiker. So they can do one of these and they get in the car. But the class has to give the hitchhiker an emotion. So maybe they say to the hitchhiker, you need to be sad. 
So everything that the hitchhiker says needs to be said in a sad way, and it also influences everyone else in the car. So now everyone else in the car needs to talk in a sad way. So they're still improving their same situation about the weather, but now the weather is so sad. And it's, oh, it's so sunny today, and oh, I really like it when it's sunny and everything is sad. After a few seconds or minutes, however it, it plays out in your situation, you introduce another hitchhiker. So have one student exit the car and the new hitchhiker gets in the back seat and the, all the students can kind of rotate. So maybe the passenger becomes the driver, um, the person from the back seat jumps up to the front seat and now the two hitchhikers are in the back. That hitchhiker introduces a new emotion. Maybe the new emotion is anger and now they're angry about everything and it's so sunny and oh, I hate it when it's sunny and and I have to wear sunglasses and all of these things. So the benefit of this game is it helps students focus on that emotional piece. But the interesting thing is the students will focus so much on the emotional piece that they'll forget that they're speaking the language piece too. When, when it's just the three in the car at the beginning and they're just kind of themselves in the car, it actually is a little bit more difficult. But suddenly when they're, they're thinking about being sad or they're thinking about being angry, the language comes out a little bit more naturally because they have like a diversion, something else that, that's occupying their mind. And so now they, they are free to, to talk a little bit more, more expressively when you introduce the emotional piece. And it helps them to use gesture, it helps them to use facial expression to express those different emotions. And it's funny, it'll make the class laugh and it's something that, that they'll get really engaged in. Um, it's a fun, fun little trick. Again, in the age of COVID, can we put the four chairs together? Eh, maybe not. So if that's the situation, again, we have to improv. Maybe they're on a bus and they're more spaced apart on the bus, whatever, whatever works. If you're virtual, you know, put them in breakout rooms, maybe, and those are different cars, whatever works. Um, but just, again, we wanna think about ways to get the kids talking, playing games like this, is a great way to kind of have the students lose themselves and they get so caught up in I want to make the class laugh, I want to do something funny, that they they are expressing themselves in another language kind of in spite of themselves. They don't even realize that they're doing it. It's really fun. And then last idea for today is called the strange neighbor. So one way that you can do this is make two circles of partners. So you have kind of an inner circle that's facing out and an outer circle facing in. So you, you partner students up and they're facing each other. And then you have the students walk around in different directions, like that scene in West Side Story, you know, when they're about to do the mambo. Do you know that one? So maybe play some music in the classroom. And then when the music stops, now they're face to face with a different partner. Again, in COVID times, maybe you have to think about a different way to partner students up. But the idea is that they're constantly being met by a different partner in some way. And as soon as the music stops and they're in front of a new partner, they have to say something outrageous, whatever comes to the top of their head in that second. So this is really teaching the skill of spontaneity. Um, so maybe the student says something like, the cat is on the roof. And the other student has to react to that. They have to say, oh no, we need to get it down, whatever. This helps students learn how to react on the fly and not have time to think, which is what happens in real life situations in, in communicative experience. We need to be able to think on our feet. And people don't always follow the script. Sometimes that's my issue with, with language learning programs such as, um, Rosetta Stone or Duolingo is they teach kids or adults, whoever's using it, kind of a prescriptive way of language. And that's just not how it works in real life. People just say random things sometimes or a random situation occurs that people react to. And so this is a great game to get students to think about those different skills too. The skill of just commenting on something bizarre, just whatever pops into your mind, but then having the ability to react to somebody else's bizarre comment. So this can be a really funny one. Um, if you don't wanna do it all at the same time, like with the two circles and partners are talking to each other, um, it's great to just have two people come up and they just have to, boom, say something to each other. And so the whole rest of the class can see how did they react? How did, how did the other person react to the crazy thing that, that the first partner said?
So those are just three examples. Again, if we were in person, we would try it out. I would give you the opportunity to play that, but hopefully those, those scenarios make sense. And those are just three ideas that you can use in your classroom to get students talking a little bit better. But there are dozens and dozens of improv games that you could use. If you just Google acting improv games, there will just be this a slew of choices that you can have. So if none of those seem particularly appealing, there are literally dozens of choices for you. So definitely feel free to Google and try them out with your students. But all kinds of acting games can be modified and used for language learners. To finish off today, I want to show you some examples of my students doing some acting and give you some ideas that you might be able to use with your own students to get them performing in um, different kinds of drama activities. So here are some types of videos or live performance activities that you could try doing with your students. The first idea is green screen videos. Unfortunately, I don't have time today to get into the technical aspect of how to make a green screen video. If that seems a little intimidating to you, I guarantee you your students know how to do it. They know how to do it. They have been making TikTok videos and YouTube videos all summer long. They are experts at video making. So if the technical aspect gets in your way, get a student involved and they will be able to help you do this for sure. But Anything can be used as a green screen. You can just get a plain um, green piece of cloth, some kind of cheap material at Walmart, wherever. Just get a nice big green piece of material, hang it up on a bulletin board, hang it on a wall, whatever works. A door works great too. And that can be used as a, as a green screen. You can also even just use green paper works too. It, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a consistent color. Um, and then students can do all kinds of things. Students can do weather reports. And so I'll show you an example of that with some preschoolers. It's the cutest thing. And you can change the background and make it look like they're actually giving a weather report from different places. And again, you want to use costumes and props, getting them dressed up and into that situation. It all helps with the, the expressiveness. Um, another idea um, that I've done is I often do units about different countries. And so at the end of the unit, my students will take everything that they've learned and do kind of an improv situation using every piece of grammar and every vocabulary word that they used within that unit. And I put them in that country by changing the background of the green screen. So I want to give you two examples right now of what that could look like in your classroom. Um, first, you're going to see some fifth grade students telling you about Nicaragua, just a little snippet of that, and then you'll get to see the cute little preschoolers giving you a weather report. So here's two little quick examples. Buenos dias de Nicaragua. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Bien, ¿cómo te llamas? Me llamo Teddy, mucho gusto. Te presento a mi abuela. ¿Dónde está tu casa? Está cerca de la farmacia. ¿Dónde es tu casa? Está lejos de escuela. ¿Bailas bien? Sí, bailo muy bien. <laughs> Okay, seriously, is that not the cutest thing you've ever seen? It's the little preschoolers speaking Spanish. So cute. Again, if the technology of all that 
seems a little bit intimidating to you, like I could never put that together. It's really not that hard. It looks kind of impressive, but really I do it all on a MacBook Air. Um, you could do it on an iPad. I promise you, your students know how to do it if you don't. So really easy to make videos like that, that look really high quality, but are really very simple to put together. Um, the other thing that's great about making videos like that is they're great to send home. Um, Oftentimes people come up to me and they find out that I can speak French and they find out that I can speak Spanish and they say, oh, say something for me in Spanish. And you feel like, I don't know what to say, right? This is what parents do too. Oh, what did you learn in Spanish today? And the kids are like, I don't know. And the parents are going, oh, I don't think my kid is learning any Spanish. I don't think my kid is learning any French. But if you send these videos home and they see their student, oh my goodness, they're speaking Spanish, they're speaking French. It's really, really helpful for, for you to uh, help the parents to understand they are learning and they are communicating in your class. So a little tip there. So my next tip that I want to talk about is modifying fairy tales. I often use fairy tales with my students when I want to do um, a longer piece that we're going to work on actually performing. And so it's a scripted thing rather than more like an improv. Those green screen videos, a little more improv. They're just kind of one-liner things that we didn't rehearse for, for weeks and weeks. They just do it kind of spontaneously. Um, but these fairy tale um, plays that you're going to see in a second are a lot more rehearsed. The reason I like using fairy tales is that the the story itself is very familiar. So if you're going to perform this, this is a great one to do in front of an audience because the audience will recognize the story even without understanding the language. So I can have my students perform exclusively in Spanish in front of their parents and maybe their parents aren't fluent Spanish speakers, but they get the gist of what's going on by knowing the, the context of the story already. And then I work with my students on expressing themselves well using body language, the facial expressions, all those um, emotional aspects of, of acting um, to, to help them understand that you want to get your message across. So you need to use your full body, not just your words, to get that message across when you're acting. So that is a great one for like a performance. The other reason I, I like using fairy tales is that the stories are generally simple enough that they can be um, adjusted for whatever language level you need. So I'm working with elementary students. I need to make these as simplified as possible. So sometimes it's actually kind of funny when you water down a fairy tale to so its just most basic parts. Um, it comes across really funny like we did Snow White one year and it was Hey, a pretty girl, wake up. I love you. Let's get married. You know, and that's kind of the gist of what happens in Snow White. Um, so I want to show you um, an example of some fifth grade students performing um, Hansel and Gretel. This they did live in front of an audience. We used to do something called the Extravaganza de Español at the end of the year. Um, and this was something that my students would work up to. We would, we would rehearse this for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and they would memorize all their lines and we would rehearse all the acting part and all the different gestures that they had to do and then they would perform it live for their parents at the end of the year as part of our Extravaganza de Español. So I'll show you just a little snippet of Hansel and Gretel. Mira Hansel, es una casa. Una casa de dulces. Veo galletas y pasteles. Y obles de dulce quiero comerla. Luego el techo es de azúcar y la puerta es de chocolate. ¡Qué delicioso! De pronto se llenaron. Había muchas cosas deliciosas para comer, pero de repente recibieron una sorpresa. La puerta se abrió. ¡Fue una bruja! <risa> ¡Ya los tengo atrapados! ¡Socorro! Aquí te pongo en una cola y tú me harás todo el trabajo. ¡Socorro! ¡Socorro! So that was my fifth graders. Again, that's weeks of rehearsal. Um, so that's an example of a long performance, one where we're focusing on the product rather than the process. Um, it's an example of a closed script where um, I had actually modified a Hansel and Gretel book and modified it for the language that they knew. And then the students were memorizing already perfected um, lines. So an example of closed versus open 
script, which was more like the green screen videos would be a more open where the students were free to express themselves how they wanted. I want to give you one last example today um, of something that my students did. This was uh, my high school students. And this is an example of a student produced script. So I think this makes a great end of the year project. This I used as my review. Um, I would have reviewed with the students anyway. This was just a way more fun way to do it. This is a great one for not necessarily a live performance, but like a film. So my students made, I think it was about 20 minutes long in the end. Um, their directions were they had to take all of the units that we learned that year, all the different vocabulary, all the different grammar, and somehow incorporate it into a story. And so these are Spanish 2 students. It's two girls that were in Spanish 2. And you can kind of tell from the, the dialogue that they're saying to each other what they were learning about. They were learning about stem changing verbs, which is something that we do in Spanish. They learned the past tense. Um, they were learning travel vocabulary, restaurant vocabulary. You're going to see those kinds of things creep up in the little snippet that I show you. Um, but the reason I say that this is a great one to do as a video, as opposed to a live performance, is this is completely made up by the students. So if they had performed this live in front of an audience, if the audience is not Spanish speaking, a lot of what was said would have been lost because they don't know the story. They're not familiar with the context. They, they would have missed a lot. But we made it as a video and then I could subtitle it. So I subtitled it in Spanish and in English, and then we had a big film festival and invited parents and whoever wanted to come to view these films that the students made as, again, this was their review for their final exam, something I would have done anyway, but we turned it into a fun thing. Um, all the different classes I taught Spanish one, two, three, and four each class made their own video and then we had this big film festival. We had a red carpet, we had popcorn, and all the different classes could watch each other's final projects. So that's kind of a fun idea for older students. And again, I didn't edit the video. The students put it together. They knew what they were doing. They put in all these special effects. There is a pretty hilarious travel scene that they pulled off that, that's pretty funny at the end. So let me show you this one. It's called La Pimienta Picante. Hablemos. ¿Por qué? ¿Dónde estoy? No te preocupes, no es importante. Necesito preguntarte algunas preguntas sobre tu esposo, Marco. ¿Qué hizo mi quiero Marco? Dímelo tú. ¿Qué le gusta comer? Uh, los tacos, pero ¿por qué quieres saber? Ajá, yo lo sabía. ¿Qué hay en los tacos? ¿Por qué se muere la gente? ¿Se muere? No sé de qué estás hablando. Bueno, ¿tú no quieres hablar? Tengo otro plan para ti. ¿Qué les gustaría comer? Yo quiero... No me gustan tacos. Quiero los espaguetis. Ay, Dios mío. Está bien. Un momento, por favor. That was so great. My students did such a good job with that. It was a really, really funny video. Um, the guy was murdering people with tacos, with the spicy peppers and tacos. I don't even know. It was pretty funny. And the, the baggage claim, they were pulling suitcases. They tied them together with a string that you couldn't see. So great. It's so great to have students be creative like that, be creative with language, have fun with language, and experience that confidence that, hey, I can do this. I can communicate. I can get a message across to an audience. And using drama techniques 
is a great way to do that. So I hope I've given you some ideas today, things to think about, ideas to play with, things that maybe you could modify a little bit to make work for your own situation, whether you're virtual, live, they can work. You can do this even if, if your students are at home. So I hope this has uh, sparked some creative juices for you and that uh, you might catch that acting bug too and use that to help your students communicate. Thanks for watching. So long.